Damn. Video games are kind of violent, aren't they? Part 1. This isn't about how they're corrupting our innocent youth or anything like that. In my opinion, no, they're not. But that's a discussion for another time. I just can't help but notice that there's a whole lot of serious injury and or death on display in our chosen hobby. Why is that, anyway? Would you believe me if I told you that in real life I've never shot so much as a single person? And I lived in Los Angeles for four years, a city where gunfire is constantly whizzing by from all directions at all times. And that whole time I never shot anybody, not even once. But in video games I've shot thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands for all I know, I never really kept track. After a while, it all just sort of blurs together. Games are defined by gameplay. Gameplay gives us the chance to interact with virtual worlds, and a hugely disproportionate amount of that interaction is dedicated to killing the inhabitants of these worlds. You can shoot the enemy, stab the enemy, throw grenades at the enemy, throw Molotov cocktails at the enemy, throw other enemies at the enemy, punch them, kick them, body slam them, throw them out of windows, shoot them with lasers, melt them with lasers, explode them with lasers, dismember them with lasers, shoot rockets at them, run them over with your car, chop them up with the blades of your helicopter, land your helicopter on top of them, attach a shrapnel mine to a rat and possess the rat and have the rat with the mine stuck to it run up to a group of enemies which will trigger the mine, attack them with crowbars, attack them with bats, attack them with chainsaws, attack them with various kinds of medieval weaponry, attack them with giant purple dildos, shoot them with explosive arrows, shoot them with regular arrows, stab them with machetes, lure them into dangerous local wildlife, set them on fire, drop heavy objects on their heads, kick them into spikes, kick them off ledges so high that the fall will almost certainly kill them, strangle them with garrots, suffocate them with plastic bags, cast spells that will burn them, cast spells that will freeze them, cast spells that will electrocute them, cast spells that will summon monsters to kill them, cast spells that will summon swarms of hungry rats to eat them. Anyway, you get the idea. Part 2. Why is this? Why, out of all the myriad things we could be simulating, have we chosen this to focus on? On the one hand, you could say that it's because violence is fun, that it naturally makes for good gameplay, that the ways to turn a firefight into a video game are obvious. But what makes them so obvious? Is it because of something fundamental about violence that makes it easy to translate into gameplay? Or are they obvious because we've spent so long experimenting with them, refining them, and incrementally improving them? Everyone knows the basic ingredients to a modern shooter, but there was a time before cover mechanics were the norm, before iron sights were the norm, before regenerating health was the norm, before reloading was the norm, even before the first-person perspective was the norm. Take a look at an FPS released in 1998 and one released today. And you'll see that for better or for worse, we've added new dimensions, experimented with new gameplay mechanics, weapons, enemy behavior, almost everything. Have the non-combat parts of games, like dialogue, seen a similar advancement? Talk to a character in an RPG from 1998 and you'll generally see two to five choices governed by relatively simple if-then relationships. Do the same thing nowadays and you'll generally see two to five choices governed by relatively simple if-then relationships. When you look at game development as a whole, you can see that the pace of innovation when it comes to simulating violence far outstrips the pace of innovation when it comes to simulating everything else. Which brings us back to the question of why, and to its somewhat disappointing answer. It's a bad habit. In my opinion, our over-reliance on violence as the primary driver of gameplay is a collective bad habit that's come to permeate almost the entire industry, and it's one that's going to be incredibly difficult to break. There is one game in particular that illustrates this more clearly than any other, and I'll cover it in part three. I tell you how great L.A. Noir is, then tell you how awful L.A. Noir is. L.A. Noir is one of my most beloved games in recent memory. Notice how I didn't say it was one of the best, I said most beloved, because I'm willing to indulge its many faults for one single reason. It tried something new. I'm not talking about the setting, though that was unique in itself. I'm talking about gameplay. It's almost entirely unique in major AAA releases in that it tried to introduce new types of interactivity in areas that had nothing to do with combat. Take a closer look at the game and it's hard not to notice how audacious it was. It actually attempted to answer questions like, how do you make a video game out of the act of investigating a crime? How do you introduce various failure states into the act of solving one? How do you introduce cycles of challenge and reward into the act of questioning a suspect? Granted, sometimes the game's answers to these questions were clumsy or unintuitive, but not always. In fact, most of the time they worked pretty well, and as a result it got a generally positive critical reception. 
I did sometimes get frustrated by the limitations of the game, by what I thought was excessive linearity and hand-holding, but only because I was seeing glimpses of a thousand fascinating possibilities, possibilities that I'd never been this close to before. But here's my problem. There were two games inside the L.A. Noir box. In one of those games, I examined crime scenes, collected clues, took notes in my notebook, and interviewed witnesses. In the other one, I shot people. Lots of people. Everywhere I went, there was a long, sprawling, intense firefight waiting for me. In one L.A. Noir, Cole Phelps is a relatively normal person. A former soldier, sure, but he doesn't have any superpowers or anything. But in the other L.A. Noir, Cole Phelps is a GTA-style one-man army, capable of dispatching 10, 15, 20 or more enemies all by himself, able to shake off multiple gunshots like they're nothing. Why is this? Why do I have to periodically interrupt my relatively grounded and low-key police procedural so Cole can pull out his pistol and charge headlong into yet another shootout with yet another entire platoon of gun-toting criminals? Just how many gangsters are there in this city? Why does a rank-and-file detective have a body count in the triple digits after just a few months on the job? Why does advancing every case I'm working on require me to wade through a fresh mountain of corpses? You know why. Because that's what the audience expected. This was a big release expected to do big sales, and if there wasn't enough shooting in it, they were worried that everyone would go, where's all the shooting? Why am I not shooting more people? It's been like 10 minutes since the last time I shot someone. Of course, having such large-scale shootouts is not really appropriate to the game's setting or its storytelling style, but that didn't matter. The expectation of having more action in a Rockstar-published game fed the reality, and the reality will feed future expectations. Do you see how this is habit-forming behavior? Do you see how this excessive reliance on an almost absurd level of constant violence to pad out our games, regardless of whether it's appropriate or not, represents an institutional bad habit that's become so deeply ingrained in both gamers and developers that we barely even notice it anymore? Breaking this habit is going to be incredibly hard. But we have to try. We have to push back. We have to make YouTube videos full to bursting with endless monotone griping. Because this habit comes with a cost. Section 4 the cost. At this time, I'd like to take a moment to join the rest of the internet in heaping shame and abuse on aliens' colonial marines, but not for the same things you've probably heard elsewhere. Not because of the texture pop-in, or the weird glitches, or the bad AI. Not to toot my own horn, but wait. Sorry, I got that mixed up. To toot my own horn? I saw this coming. Not because I knew that Gearbox, or whoever actually made the game, was going to botch it, but because I knew that Aliens was unlikely to ever work as a shooter. If there was ever a setting that was crying out for survival horror mechanics, this is it. The Xenomorphs are terrifying because they're so physically and emotionally overpowering. Even experienced soldiers are reduced to blind panic in their presence and picked off one by one. This atmosphere can't be recreated in a traditional shooter, where the player has been trained to expect to be able to defeat hordes of enemies, and where a sudden instant kill is considered unfair. But a traditional shooter is what they made, because it's what they were expected to make. When it's skillfully used, violence can be a powerful dramatic tool, a way to ratchet up the stakes as high as they'll go, to make things literally a matter of life and death. When it's used indiscriminately, it can have the exact opposite effect, numbing the audience and reminding them that what they're seeing is artificial and meaningless. The Aliens movies created a dark, claustrophobic atmosphere, rich in body horror and psychological terror, where death could be lurking in any shadow. In Aliens Colonial Marines, you mow down wave after wave of faceless mooks. Classic films like Chinatown and L.A. Confidential created a disturbing vision of pre- and post-war Los Angeles, where the California sunshine takes on a menacing quality, and the air is thick with alienation and injustice. In L.A. Noir, you mow down wave after wave of faceless mooks. The classic westerns of Sergio Leone created a new style and rhythm to gunplay, featuring a slow, deliberate, almost excruciating build-up to a sudden explosion of violence that's over almost as fast as it starts. In Red Dead Redemption, you mow down wave after wave of faceless mooks. Even otherwise good games like L.A. Noir and Red Dead can be undermined by an unnecessary adherence to convention, and the continuous reinforcement of these conventions makes the range of game possibilities much narrower than it needs to be. Part 5. What to do. It's no small thing that I'm asking the industry to do here. I mean, take the shooting galleries out of some games and there'll be nothing left. 
What's more, it's easy for me to sit here and say we should change the dominant tenor of games as a medium. I'm not the one that has to actually come up with a replacement, let alone do the difficult work of implementing it. And thank God I'm not, because I don't really like doing difficult things. In the future, I may make a video where my unsolicited advice is more specific and irritating, but for now I'm going to keep it general. Slow down the violence. Not stop it, slow it down. Whenever you get to the section of your game that requires me to kill ten or more people, stop for a second and consider whether it's really reinforcing the goal you're going for, or if it's something you're doing out of habit. Stop and consider whether it's adding to the experience. In some cases, the answer might be yes. In Saints Row, over-the-top violence is entirely appropriate. In L.A. Noir, not so much. In my opinion, slowing down the violence is important for the future of the medium. It's a habit we have to break, because so long as we're using this habit as a crutch, it's going to limit the potential of gameplay. And breaking it won't be easy, which is why it's so important that we nag them constantly to do so.